Would you like to see an x-ray of your soul? An x-ray of your emotional infrastructure? Well, just like the body today with scans, with x-rays, with different types of technologies, we can see the inner workings of what makes us tick. We have a blueprint that will give you a picture of the spectrum of your emotions and understanding how they work and what you can do to improve them. Check out the description below. The special Omer book, 49 Steps, Personal Refinement, Character Development, Understanding and Cultivating the Very Nature of Your Emotional Being. The social influences that are exerting themselves upon us, imposing themselves upon us. Take just a very basic thing, the idea that people are selling you something to you. That means they have to convince you to buy something, which means not necessarily the best thing for you, but they want to convince you it's the best thing for you. And it may be a good thing for you, but how do you really determine? So there's the ongoing mani emotional manipulation of our minds and of our hearts to, to determine what we value. And I was just reading an article the other day about how the journalism has become so bastardized and so compromised by the fact that right now it's focused on getting audiences. Whereas once, at least there was the illusion that you're standing for something. Now it's about how many people are going to watch something and what kind of headline will go viral. And topics that not necessarily have any journalistic value, but are we know will get a lot of people watching, is the determining factor, even in the most, some of the most um, prestigious and, uh, and, uh, and sophisticated journalistic outlets. Um, you know, some people think Trump is, it epitomizes it, and of course the media feeds into it because... It's like an ongoing circus. So when you look at the world around you, you start seeing a type of um, focus where we're being taught to be more superficial than, to focus more on the superficial than on the real, to focus more on the sizzle than on the steak, more on the package than on the product, more on form than on, uh, than, than on function, and more on matter than on spirit. You can go on and on and list and when you, so when you have forces from so many different directions, and now they have access to us 24-7, what, what is it doing for you and your own self-value? If you're being told that if you buy this, you're going to be more, you're going to be happier. And if you don't, you're going to feel deprived. It's essentially a message that you don't have what it takes to be confident. You need this, you need to drive this car, look this way, travel to this place, purchase this item. So we're in a world which is, a, which is on a uh, offensively, an, a, a, we're, we're not in a neutral world, we're in a world that we are constantly under attack and assault on our psyches. Now I don't want, I, I mean, it's, I know it comes across almost like a doomsday, uh, and uh, like um, fire and brimstone, but I don't mean it that way at all. I mean it in a subtle way, but what does it really do for our self-esteem and self-confidence? How much of our decisions are really determined from within? How much are you generating and saying, one second, let me determine what is valuable to me, and I feel confident and strong that in my convictions, and then let me go find what I need. How, much, how many decisions are we making that way? It's a pretty good question to ask yourself. On a daily basis, from the morning you awake till the moment you go to sleep, how much are you really deciding coming from within? And if it's not coming from within, rest assured, it's not building your self-confidence. Because confidence is built from within. Esteem is built from within. Learning to trust yourself. Learning to value yourself. And that, and I can speak also from personal experience, my own experience and what people I deal with, this is one of the most, the most precious and rare commodities today is having self-value, to value yourself. Now what I just described was the adult world. You throw into the equation now our childhoods, our young formative years, and if you grew up in an environment that was constantly, you were constantly being criticized, invalidated by parents, by adults, by educators, by people who are supposed to nurture us, you can rest assured you're not coming into a level playing field as an adult. Because you're already on the defense. You already start second guessing yourself and you're wondering whether your decisions are right. You know, children naturally, as we shall discuss more at length shortly, are naturally confident um, entities. They're born, they have no reason not to be. They expect love, not because of a sense of entitlement, because it's a natural thing, like a flower expects water. A flower expects that the gardener is going to nurture and water the, the garden. 
child naturally expects, not in words, but just by its disposition, by its personality, that it will be taken care of. And that's the way it's meant to be. That's the way we are created. We are not self-sufficient when we're young. Nine months, when we're in our mother's womb, we're completely nurtured and cared for. And then when we finally come out of the mother's, our mother's womb, we still are in a state that needs a lot of nurturing, a lot of protection, a lot of um, care, caring and love to be able to um, cultivate that sense of uh, confidence in ourselves. So in a healthy situation, a child grows up feeling that, feeling wanted, feeling validated, valued. When a parent says, I will spend time with you, without even saying the words, that the child senses, you care about me, I'm more important than other things. When a parent runs out of the house and gives the child less attention and it becomes consistent that way, there's a message there. It doesn't make a difference how many gifts you buy the child and how many videos and how many trips you may take them and how many uh, um, uh, candies and ice creams you give them. The bottom line, a child will know that you have other things that are more important. And children are very simple. When they get that message en enough times, they begin to say to themselves, maybe I'm not that valuable. And it's not about an ego trip. It's about the basic, the garden, the flowers will begin to wither if they're not watered. Now, unfortunately, we live in a world where this is unfortunately more common than not, that most of us have been deprived to some extent. You know, I'm not gonna say that everybody to the fullest extent, you know, in the most extreme way is obviously true abuse, true absenteeism, true invalidation in the full sense of the word, in the painful sense of the word, and that doesn't mean the person is, that, that, that the situation is hopeless, but it means it's an uphill battle. Because once a person is already, as a child has developed, a sense that I'm not really valuable, that, and I can't really trust my own feelings because I used to come home from school all enthusiastic, and my father who was drunk, or my mother who was neurotic, would criticize everything I did because of their own issues and their projections. As, as much as therapy you go through, there's that knee-jerk reaction What's, that's, I'm doing something wrong. And I've met people that even without anyone criticizing them, they immediately say, what did I say wrong? I'm sure you have situations, sometimes you say something, you look at them, and you look at someone and say, okay, what did I do wrong now? Why would you assume you did something wrong? Reminds me more than once this happened, I'm sitting, sitting with someone in a private session, counseling. And uh, you know, I, I remember once this particular case where I brought the person a cup of water and I put it down, and as I lifted my hand, she flinched, and for no reason. It wasn't like, I said, why'd you flinch? She said, I thought you were gonna smack me. So I said, why would I smack you? Did I indicate any hostility to you or anything? She says, no. But in my life, my childhood, when a hand was lifted, it was usually gonna be a slap. And she's developed a new jerk reaction. Now, this may sound crazy, but we all do things like that. You begin to react. When you, something happens enough times to you, you will begin to, um, Build, a, uh, build up a reaction, a reflexive reaction to whatever situation you're in. Now, if this happens consistently, you know, remember children, like all of us, are resilient and we can absorb and be flexible to many situations, but if it happens consistently, and it's like an assault on our consciousness, on our psyches, and our, valid, and our value, we slowly develop a sense that I'm guilty until proven innocent, when in truth you should be innocent until proven guilty. And by contrast, people who have been nurtured and have built that self-esteem, it doesn't mean they can, that they will, won't have moments of doubt and they won't have moments of questioning themselves, but their status quo, their, uh, their um, so-called equilibrium is one of measure, a certain measure of confidence. So a lot of all this discussion has a lot to do tremendously with our own childhoods. And you can't avoid that issue. You talk about self-esteem, it's almost textbook. You have to, the first thing, almost look at what kind of childhood did you have. And not because we're looking for, a, for to, to dig up a can of worms, worms or to look for trouble. It's simply because you have to understand what has shaped you. And then you can intervene and do something about that. So essentially, to sum up what I've said so far is based on the principle that half the problem I'm sorry, a, the, the awareness is half the cure of a problem. Before you deal with the solutions, you must have awareness of the situation, basically what we call a diagnosis, an evaluation. Just like it is on the physical sense, you come into, let's say, a person is bleeding, God forbid, they come into hospital, emergency room, or something else, the first thing that we need to figure out what's going on. Where's the bleeding coming from? 
You have to stop the bleeding. You have to first evaluate before you intervene. And anyone without the, the training says, you know what, oh, maybe this. That would be very dangerous. You can create more problems if you start guessing. So the first thing is awareness, awareness, diagnosis. So the same thing here in self-esteem issues, first thing is awareness. What are the factors that are contributing right now presently? It could very well be our childhood. Okay, that's one. We'll go through the usual suspects, so to speak. Number two, it could be the oppressive environment of the social, your social setting, state, meaning right now presently you may be working for an oppressive boss. You may have very unpleasant employees. You may have people that you're dealing with, family members or others that are toxic. I mean, I'm just using extreme examples. I don't mean to, I'm just trying to make the point. It could be a little milder version, but you right now you're not, you are presently, basically it's like someone who's, uh, who is uh, suffering from an illness and they're continuing to consume or breathe toxic air. So obviously whatever you do is not gonna help because they have to stop, they have to stop continuing the diet or the, the, or the environment that they're in. So it's a critical to understand these factors. So if you talk about, if you list the suspects, I mentioned some before, but I'll just sum it up. As I said, childhood experiences, number one, must be looked at because that tells a lot. Number two is what kind of situation you find yourself in right now, presently. The type of work you're at, what are your pressures, who's demanding things of you, what are the expectations, what do you think are the expectations? Because that all is having a direct impact on your own confidence. Because if the expectations are overwhelming and unrealistic, so you're constantly saying, look, I continuously fail. You know, take for the third, a third area to look at is your relationships. Where do you stand in the area of, yes, courtship, romance, love, sexuality? That is, it bears tremendous amount uh, on, on our own self-esteem because are you successful in that area? Are you not? Are you desperate? Are you doing things that are self-destructive because of the need for love? Do you not know how to find the proper partner, the proper, a proper relationship, because maybe you don't have the standard or you don't have role modeling, etc. I'm not going to go through the list of every usual suspect, obviously, just general categories. But there's no way to deal with self-esteem and self-confidence issues if you don't look at these things, because they're actively having impact in your life right now. So it's just to sit here and I'll give a talk about what self-esteem is on a theoretical level without addressing what, what factors are shaping you as we speak? is like I said earlier, it's like someone trying to detox uh, from one end, so they have like a, a detox tubes pulling out the toxins, on the other end you're feeding yourself toxins. So what, what, what are we gonna gain? This expression in the Talmud that says, Tevil v'sheriz biyode. It means somebody's going into a mikvah, a mikvah is a ritual bath to purify themselves, but they're carrying a toxic thing in their hand and they don't even realize it. So they're bathing themselves. It's like somebody going to take a bath, but they're oozing with all kinds of grime or oil, and they're just, uh, you know, first you've got to stop the flow of the negative before you bring in the positive. It would be like trying to bring new furniture into your house when it's full of dust and dirt and grime. First you've got to clean up, at least create some type of environment. Then you can bring in something fresh. Which, of course, even though this sounds almost like, uh, not, uh, it's almost, uh, almost absurd, but very often, you'll f I'm sure you'll find this, we all do these absurd things. That's what the human condition is a measure of absurdity to it. Where people say, I don't know, I keep trying new things and it's not working. And they don't realize that they're still maintaining old habits while they're trying new things. Like the line that I, I always, uh, I don't know who coined it, I think I coined it, but, a, but some combination of different things I heard over the years. Um, maybe I'm not trying to take credit for it. Maybe it's uh, plagiarism of some form. But the line goes like this. If you think what you thought, and you say what you said, and you do what you did, what will you have? Can you figure it out? What you had. You'll have what you had. If you think what you thought, and you speak what you spoke, and you say what you said, meaning you continue doing what you did yesterday in thought, speech, and action, what will be the results? The same results. Now, I'm not sure if this is a famous line. Insanity is somebody saying, doing the same things and expecting different results. Or as they say in the healing world, if nothing changes, nothing changes. Now these seem to be like simple, simple, simple idioms and simple uh, maxims and ideas, but it's easy to give, as we all know, it's easier to give advice to others than to yourself. And the fact is we're all guilty of this, of our blind spots and our subjectivity that don't allow us to see 
sometimes that we are our own worst enemy. And even though you're sincere in looking for change, but you're not changing anything as you look for the, seek that change. And there's no way around that. People say, I want change, but I want to change anything. Tell me the logic in that. It doesn't work that way. If you have a bad habit, you're going to have to change some things to get rid of that bad habit. And to say, I'm just going to assume a new habit and forget about the bad habit, but if you have the bad habit, it's going to come back to haunt you. This is a challenge, but the beauty of the, the I shouldn't say the beauty, the good news is, the good news is, as I said, awareness is half the cure. Even if you may not be able to completely overcome your past patterns and routines and habits, but the first step is awareness. So very often I'll tell someone, I'll say, listen, we're not looking to change, that's who you are, but at least be aware. Be aware that every time someone lifts their hand, you feel someone's going to slap you. No, that's not natural. I'm not suggesting suddenly change your whole emotional um, makeup. That's, who you, that's how you're wired right now. But until you recognize that this is an issue, you're, not, you're definitely not going to do anything about it. So the first step is what we'll call, some people, some psychologists call it like the cognitive life raft. At least in your mind understand that's not the right way to react. I still react that way, but at least I understand it's not. It's like the Baal Shem Tov says something very fascinating, the great mystic, the Baal Shem Tov, he says, that there are two types of darkness. There's darkness, and you know it's dark, and the dawn will come, and the light will come. But then there's a darkness that's so dark that it conceals that it's dark. He calls it double darkness. In the verse in the Bible, it says, Haster Aster, a double cover. It covers the fact that there is something to cover. And then you can convince yourself night is day, ugly is beauty, something negative is positive. That's when there's the real distortions because you don't even know that you don't know. So the first step is saying, one second, I, to convince yourself, for example, that you're experienced in the area you're not experienced is a perfect example. But then you come to an awareness and say, one second, you know something? I'm not experienced in this area. There's nothing wrong with that. Maybe I need help. Maybe I need to go to a professional. That awareness is the first step to all growth. No one's asking you to become perfect. But very often people with low self-esteem, low self-confidence have to develop an illusion that I'm, I can do it. A person with self-confidence is the first person that's going to admit I can do it. I know it sounds paradoxical, but that's exactly the point, because a confident person knows what they're good at, and this is, they're very clear about it, and they're very clear that here's some things I'm not, so I hire someone or I consult with someone that has a clear view on the matter. A person with low self-confidence, you'll find, often does not go for advice because they feel they have to compensate. To go back to the childhood, the childhood experiences, when your father or mother or any adult continuously berated you and criticized you and said to you, What's the matter with you? What do you start doing? You stop going for help. You start making a sh putting on a show to prove to your father you don't need anybody. I, I can do it. And it's really, a, it's really a fabrication. It's a fabricated sense of, of, uh, of, um, of toughness or um, what's the word I want to use, bravado, that you feel I can do anything. Very confident people are the first to say, here's my strengths and here are the things I need help in. Because there's a, they have a, a clear sense of their boundaries, of their strengths, and of their weaknesses, which we'll be discussing as well. So to sum up what I've said so far is this. Self-esteem goes to the core, essentially, of who you are, what has shaped you, and what is shaping you presently. And until you're ready to step back and say, okay, here are the factors that are contribute to why I second-guess myself, why I have difficulty with commitment, why I have difficulty with... Um, with making decisions. Doesn't mean you have to expose yourself and, and, and go announce it and advertise it. We're talking about between you and yourself or between people you trust in a very confidential and discreet way. If you, that's the first step. You have to be able to identify. It doesn't have to be perfect. Just identify because that becomes the beginning of defanging the enemy is recognizing the enemy. You know, in warfare, the key to all warfare is not how powerful you are or how many arms you have, or how, much, or how many firepower. It comes down to often confidence, psychological warfare. If the enemy thinks you're stronger, you may be weaker, but you already won. And the same thing is emotionally and psychologically. When we are not aware and we think the enemy is much bigger than it is, then the enemy does become bigger because you, you empower, you're feeding, you're fueling your enemy. So it's critical to be able to defang the enemies by awareness. 
It's like you shine a light on something, the maggots and the parasites run away. Because they, 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 they thrive in darkness. Our own weaknesses, our fears, our inhibitions, and, and including our, our low self-esteem and self-confidence, is, thrives when we don't understand what's going on. Because when you're confused and you're lost and you don't know, when there's clarity, you always begin to build confidence. It's like someone say, you'll say, you know what? I'm afraid of going to, uh, taking upon myself this and this new project or take upon myself a new um, goal. And when you're asked, okay, why are you afraid? So you list the whole reasons because I could fail at this, I could fail at that, you know, all the different reasons. How will you ever build the courage to take on this challenge? So people who have low self-confidence won't. They'll just back off, retreat, and say, I'll take on other challenges. But then you'll discover a pattern that this repeats itself many times because it's not about this particular project. Of course, each, in each case, you're going to find excuses why this is not possible to be done. That's what a non-confident person does. A confident person looks at it, analyzes it. doesn't say necessarily it's easy. It's difficult, but I've analyzed the, 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 the measure of its difficulty. Here are the challenges, and now I'm going to figure out how to get around them. So they don't see anything as being impossible. They see it as, okay, it's formidable, but I, I will uh, first uh, get a, a lay of the land, understand the challenge, understand the enemy, so to speak, and from there I will be able to then assess what to do. Now, there are obviously real situations where, where anyone, even a very confident person, says, this may not be an area I want to take upon. It's too, too difficult. But it's not coming from weakness. It's coming from strength. It's coming from clarity that, you know what, I explored, and this is maybe not something I should be doing. Not through, due to retreat, due to clarity. So the key to the confident person is the clarity they have. They look at the situation, assess it for what it is, not what it appears to be. Because if you rely on what it appears to be, it can look a lot bigger and bigger monster than it is. So that is why shining a light and clarity is critical in diffusing any type of adversarial situation. <coughs> but all these are the tools of the confident person who goes in and says, okay, I'm going to find clarity. What we call due diligence, do research, look into it before you just say no. I find this very often when it comes, especially in the, in the dating scene, and someone suggests someone to someone, and they say, no, it's not for me. I said, did you look into the person? No, I just have an instinct. Okay, an instinct, fine. Okay, then, then you push it a little. For, am I describing uh, some, anyone here? Okay, okay, fine. But, and uh, so then if that's the case, may, how do you know maybe your instinct is off? You know, what is it based on? Maybe it's just your fear of not succeeding. Maybe you've been hurt. Enough times, you're not looking to be hurt. There's nothing wrong with saying that. But to say that requires courage. That alone requires confidence, to say I don't have confidence. A non-confident person usually will not say that. They will not say it. A confident person will say very clearly, this is water is out. This is the downside of technology, huh? Okay, so where were we? So the first step I was talking about, the dating scene and person instincts and so on, is to be honest with yourself and looking at the factors and the forces that are shaping um, and defining how we make decisions. And though it takes work, and I will discuss that shortly, but you really want to get to a point once you identify what you can do to counter that. So let's take, let's get to the, the bull by the horns. Let us indeed say that someone grew up in a home and environment. In their formative years, they were invalidated, one way or another. Sometimes it can be quite extreme. You know, the children of divorce suffer from this because often they blame themselves. That's what children do and they feel something matter with them. They feel they're the cause. Parents often don't help by subtly suggesting and blaming and so on and projecting. So once you identify any of the above, then the next step is what do you do to counter it? The answer is you need to have a very heavy dose of validation to counter the invalidation. But here's the challenge. People who have been invalidated in a way become their own worst enemy 
and they usually don't like to hang around people that are confident. So they often, make, misery loves company. The friends and others they meet feed their own self-perception. That's what happens. And you have to be fully aware of that. It's one of the biggest challenges. Because like I said earlier, we don't change our thoughts and our speech and our actions just because we want to. If a person does have a, um, has been invalidated and does not have a healthy sense of self-value and self-esteem and so on, what will happen will be no question. What will happen is that they will so-called um, look unconsciously, not consciously, look for ways to confirm their own negative self-image. And we all do this. And it's a very difficult thing to fight because obviously no one's going to do that deliberately. No one's going to say, I'm, waking up the I'm going to wake up in the morning. I'm going to figure out how to undermine myself today. Does anybody have that on their to-do list? You, you, have, you write it on your to-do list, really? I'm going to, okay. I, that bad I've never seen. I mean, there are people, by the way, that do that. That's when a person really is self-loathing. But we don't do it consciously. That's the problem. If we did it consciously, then at least we could address it. We do it unconsciously. We almost like set ourselves up to make sure that you can that that you're not gonna you, you're, that uh, you're gonna fail at something. You undermine it in the first place. So you don't really fail. This happens very often in relationships. Many people, when it gets too close for comfort, and somebody's getting closer to you emotionally, what what will you do if you're a person that's lacking self-esteem? You're gonna under, you're gonna sabotage it before they do, because you don't want them to hurt you. So you end up hurting it. This is typical behavior. Now, what I'm describing are things that are easier to identify, but there are many things that we can identify. You know, simple things like even, even, even mundane things like what kind of jobs we choose, what kind of challenges we'll take upon ourselves. A person who's been invalidated from young age is usually going to is going to cut themselves short from really achieving what they're capable of. So it's almost like a given. That someone let lower self-esteem, lower self, lower self-value, the higher, the, I'm sorry, the less challenges you'll really take upon yourself because you don't want to get into a situation where you may fail and you doubt yourself too much, so you t so you so you don't shoot the your, your high your bar you keep very low, and if you're very smart, what you do is you cover your tracks so no one really can notice, and that's that, and then you live out your life never really living up to the potential you're capable of. That's how sad it is. So how do you counter this? You counter this by being very honest and candid and blunt with yourself and always critical to have an objective friend that you invite to kick you in the pants, not in a bad way, you invite in to be able to challenge you and what you want to do is counter it by not allowing yourself to do that. An example, taking on a challenge that you would not want to take on naturally. I'm talking about a good challenge, I'm not talking about doing something that's, God forbid, self-destructive uh, or anything like that. Maybe, the, maybe that's exactly what you need, is to take on a challenge that you thought you're not capable of, and why don't you try? You know, you swam in waters to this point, why don't you swim in a little deeper waters? And I'm not talking about doing anything reckless or crazy, even though that could also not hurt sometimes, to do something a little nuts. Um, but the key thing is to get out of your comfort zone, because that's how changes happen. Shifts happen when you shift something. There's no way around that. And that is the little secret that nobody wants to hear. Everybody wants to say, I want to change, but I don't want to shift anything. Well, that doesn't work. It doesn't work. I'm not suggesting cold turkey to shift everything. You take it step by step. One of the suggestions I always make is like in a very simple level, like when let's say you have your wires tangled up. You know what I mean? Or your hair is tangled. Or something else is tangled up. I mean physically even. What's, how do you untangle things? So most of us, we get impatient, impatient, and we just start pulling and pulling and and what happens? It gets more tangled to the point you can't even untangle it any longer. The secret to untangling things is patience and looking at the edges and the extremities, untangle the part of the wires that are easy to untangle. And then you can isolate that area that's most difficult. It sounds like, it sounds like so simple, but most people simply don't do that because they either are so emotional about it, they just want to fix it. It's called simple process of take upon yourself a challenge that maybe is not the hardest one. If you're going to try to attack and say, you know what, I have low self-esteem, I'm going to go to a boot camp, 
seven-day boot camp where they tell you after seven days and $20,000, you're going to have self-esteem. Rest assured, you, it'll probably make it worse. It's like they say, why are these books all bestsellers? They keep telling you, here's the 10 steps to a healthy love, 20 steps to self-esteem, 30 steps, whatever. Why do they keep selling? Because obviously they don't work, or else the books wouldn't keep selling. Why would someone have to write a new book? You know, people with self-confidence usually don't buy these books unless they're going to write a book and they want to see how others are doing. You know? So the point I'm making here is choose challenges that are out of your comfort zone, but they don't have to be the ones that are the most difficult. And we all can identify some things that are more difficult than something that, because small victories lead to big victories. That's the key. Make small shifts, and the small shifts will allow you to make bigger shifts. And then there will come the point where you'll have to deal with the big, most entangled part of your life, and that may be directly your own childhood or other things that are undermining your own confidence and your own self-value and, and, and trusting yourself. And it becomes easier when you've untangled most of it because then you, you have the last step, the last uh, so-called uh, frontier makes it a lot easier. So that's one way to go. And this is easy to do any day, tomorrow morning, tonight, make a commitment, you'll join a new class, you read a new book, but it has to be something that's fresh and not a part of your past patterns. That's how you counter, especially deep-rooted invalidation and uh, that's a result of absenteeism or other childhood experiences that cause us to, in our formative years, to lose self-trust and self-confidence. Now, just for the record, even though self-confidence and self-esteem are interchangeable usually, they actually don't mean exactly the same thing. I mean, there's even debates on the topic, but my take on it somewhat is that self-confidence, there are people that have low self-esteem but can have self-confidence. It's usually not the other way around. Why? Because self-esteem really gets to trust, it's really being able to value yourself, esteem. Do you have esteem for yourself? Do you respect yourself? Confidence can be taught. In this particular area, there are people that are very good at doing something, so they're confident in what they do, but it doesn't mean they necessarily respect themselves. They've learned to be good at something. And it's still valuable, because at least you have that, but self-confidence is more about um, trusting yourself, trusting I can do it. You know, I can drive a car. I've done it enough times. So I have confidence in driving a car. Is it really, is it self-esteem? Not necessarily. You can be a person of very low self-esteem and be a great driver. I mean, that sounds a little odd, what I just said, but I'm just giving you an example. My point is you can be good at something and be confident in it, but simply because you're trained and you, and you know you have the skill. Self-esteem gets deeper into the self-valuing and trusting yourself. I'm sorry, valuing and esteem for yourself. Not just, not just trusting, but valuing yourself. But in the context of our discussion here, both obviously, I, I'm interchanging them because they're both, the broad sense of the term, we want, we want to have both. And self-esteem is obviously gets much more to the person who you are. So, so one of the ways, so, so the key is identifying and countering it. If, for example, let's just take a very simple example. Let's say you play tennis. And whatever it is, the way your um, your 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 uh, muscle or your physical physiology is shaped, you have a quirky way of um, of uh, striking a of of serving a tennis ball, or a, a certain way of throwing a bowl uh, a bowling a uh, bowling ball. So what are, what are you trained to do? If it's like let's say it tends to go to the left a little too much, you train yourself to adjust, adjust. Let's say. Your, your angle or your other things. So it compensates for your, no one's trying to, going to change you because it's more, very hard to change someone's natural habits. But you can adjust. Just like when you see something's going a little too much to the left, you adjust accordingly. Psychologically, that's also a key thing, knowing how to navigate. And knowing how to navigate is the critical component in really building that self-confidence. So if you're a person, for example, that your initial reaction is that you hesitate or you retreat or you're afraid, for whatever reason, and you know that. Again, as I said, you don't have to force it upon yourself, but the shifts you have to make have to be direct proportion to the areas where you feel weak. So in the, in the area where we have that lack of that confidence, you have to find things that validate, which means getting involved, let's say, in a project that's out of your comfort zone, but you see, you know what? I'm working with people that are competent. I'm learning from them. It's like incubating. You hang around with people that are better than you in something, and you learn from them. 
Now, a truly low self-confident person say, I don't want to hang around successful people because it makes me feel like a failure. They'll laugh at me. I'll, I, I, it'll be glaring, so I'd rather hang around losers. That way it doesn't stand out. Again, nobody makes any bumper stickers or business cards that announce I'm a loser and I like to hang around losers. But subtly, we make these little decisions. You know, you try to go, you go to the places that you're more comfortable. Whereas when you're countering lack of self-confidence, what you want to really do is go into areas that you're not so comfortable, but hang around people that are confident in what they do. And, and assist them, help them. There's nothing wrong. Every, nobody, nobody is born an expert in anything. You learn from those that are good. And you, it rubs off, and their confidence rubs off. So these are things that we can actively do on an ongoing basis. And just needs a little creativity and a little attention, figuring out where it is. Because you know, it's very hard to, in a group of people to give specifics because each of us have our own little challenges. But now, to take upon yourself something and say, you know what? Um, you know that, let's say, uh, you'd, love to, uh, you'd love to play a musical instrument. But objectively, people tell you you're never going to do it, whatever reason. It's not natural to you. It's too much difficult. Some people are more naturally inclined to it. So you have to choose your battles too. Sometimes to put, set your mind to something that's completely unrealistic that is not a sign of failure but that you're unable to do it. It's just a sign of clarity, again, clarity, of awareness, where you should take upon yourself. So, so the first thing is really to see, and that's why an objective mentor can help in this regard, where are your potential strengths that you've not yet really um, actualized? And that can come with something that in your own mind and feeling you feel you really could be good at, you're not good at yet. And the question then is, what game plan can you make to be able to get there? This is the process of growth. And it's not about achieving perfection. And it's not about suddenly becoming the super confident person from the non-confident. It's about building, it's like muscle conditioning. Nothing's done overnight. You build, you build. As I said before, small victories breed bigger victories. Success breeds success. Small un un untangling things leads to bigger untangling things. It's, just, it's the rule of the game. There's no reason to feel that you have to, uh, you have to cram it all and succeed, it all, succeed in one shot. It's step by step by step. And don't be afraid of making a mistake, because that's one of the big fears of, unfortunately, children growing up in homes. The terror. If I made a mistake, my father's going to come home, and he's going to kill me for it. And, you know, as children, we are terrified of these things. Um, I, I just remember some of my little fears. And they're completely irrational when you get older. And um, I mean, this is, I, I, thank God it was only a one-time thing, but I remember it. I remember I was in summer camp. And I was, uh, I was not a, I, well, let's put it this way, I was uh, somewhat of a troublemaker. Not the worst type, but uh, disrupting, a disruptive force, as they say today. And I don't even remember what I did, but one of the other counselors came over to me and, uh, and then he says to me, because of what you did, you're going to have to come to dinner tonight in your pajamas. That's what he said. You know? And as a little kid, what was I, nine years old, eight years old, you know, you don't think rationally. I was, like, terrified. And I didn't call my parents. I didn't call anyone because whatever, children don't feel that they can call for help because they feel they're under the control of the spell. That's part of the problem. And I remember all day, I, I can't tell you, I was just in dread. You know those dreads, which of course afterward turned out to be completely, you know, basically he didn't even remember what he said. And I was in dread, I was avoiding him. I was thinking, now think about the rash. What is, guys, is a camp of 500 kids, they're going to have one guy sitting in the pajamas there. You know, it's obviously ridiculous. But that's what he told me. And I, I, maybe it was important for me to experience to understand dread a little. Because as, since, as I grow into an adult, I meet people who actually still have that dread. To me, it's a joke now. I did, by the way, give it to that guy. He got older. I met him one day. And I said, I want to tell you something that you said to me when I was nine years old. And today I can protect myself. And, uh, you know, so if I was, uh, I would have punched him in his face if I was, like, a little more violent. I didn't do that. I just let him know. He said, I said that? I said, yeah, 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 that's what you said. I hope you don't say it to your own children. <laughs> And he didn't mean anything. I don't even have any, I don't have one feeling, a negative feeling. You know, he said it, he threw out a lie. But you never know. Children, things are very different. A little, a little sound sounds to a child like a, ma a major, uh, you know, major earthquake. 
The point I'm making is that these are factors of our childhood that affect us, and they can be completely ridiculous, but they become embedded in our psyches and affects how we look at things. So that is critical. That is why it's so critical to counter it by inundating yourself with experiences that are exact opposite. Which means the most important thing for someone who has not had so much love in their life is to have a lot of love in their life. But you'll say, it's okay, it's a catch-22. I don't feel I deserve love, so how am I going to have love when I grew up in a, in a loveless situation? Again, I'm just using extremes to make the point. Obviously, we're all fit in somewhere in between. And the answer is, you know, my friend, you have to force yourself. It doesn't sound going to just come easy. Yeah, you got to do something that's going to get yourself out of your comfort zone. It doesn't come easy change like that. And you have to identify that. So fine, we're not, again, we're not talking about doing something radical necessarily, even though, as I said, at times that may not hurt you. But under the guidance of someone that understands the dynamics of how people build their own confidence, you find examples, you find situations. Anybody here in this room or anyone listening wants examples, you want to contact us, contact me. I just need to hear more about your profile, a little more about your life. I can give you some suggestions. But I guarantee you that if you really apply your mind to it, you can find your own suggestions. It's not that difficult if you're willing. The difficulty is being willing, not the ideas. If you're not willing, then you know then, uh, you don't show up. If you don't show up, obviously nothing's going to happen. But being willing, then comes the next step. Okay, let me figure out. Don't hide behind and saying, I don't have any suggestions, therefore it's not possible. That's just a nice smokescreen of saying, I'm afraid to enter there. So there's no suggestion. There's always suggestions. There's no such thing as an impossible situation in this regard. Okay. So let's talk about something even more fundamental now. We'll go a little deeper. And this is really the best news of all. And that is like this. If indeed we were people that did not have as a natural birthright uh, self-love and self-trust and self-confidence, self-esteem, then you could say, you know what, if I didn't get it in my childhood from my parents and I'm now living in a hostile workplace or a hostile world in general that basically really I have to constantly play defense because people are critical and people are negative and people are selfish people are jealous and so on, then you can could, you could make the philosophical argument that, you know what, hey, too bad. You were dealt the wrong set of cards, deck of cards, and now uh, you got to live with it. But that's not the case at all. And this brings me back to a point I always make, because to me is the key to all healing. And I've said this to many therapists I've spoken to. I always ask therapists that I know, and I, some of them come to me for supervision or other discussions, I said, how much, how much do you truly believe in the, in, the, <clears throat> in the spirit, the spirit of your client? How much do you really believe in them? And when people are honest, sometimes they'll say, I don't really believe that much. I'm trying to create damage control, make it a little easier. I say, so you're taking money from a client, and you don't really believe, are you telling them that as well? that you don't really believe in them and their possibility? Of course not. How could I tell them that? That undermines the whole uh, thing. But that would be like someone who you are paying to be your life coach or your personal coach, and they don't really believe you're capable of doing what you're paying them to help you do. It's a somewhat uh, unethical, some would say. But I understand why some people feel that way, because especially when you go with a, uh, we'll talk a Freudian, what I call Freudian Darwinian model of the human being, so essentially that we're really the id, in Freud's words, is the driving force, a wild, untamed, selfish, pleasure-seeking um, uh, force inside of you. And then we can superimpose upon ourselves some type of civility, ego and superego. Then basically we're trying to keep people at bay, but really we're at the end of the day, we're animals at heart, we're beasts. And just like you cannot stop an animal who's hunting for prey, at the end of the day, when human beings are pushed, push comes to shove, they're also that way. And we see sometimes horrible ways human beings can treat, mistreat each other when they're, in desperate, when they're desperate, when they're dying from hunger, when they're in an avalanche and there's nothing to eat, or when they have to save their own skin. We've seen it in the worst possible ways. So if you make a case for the human being in that fashion, 
then I don't know how really one can really build any self-confidence, self-esteem. You're living in a world where, as I said, survival of the fittest. But here is the position that I've obviously embraced that comes from the teachings of mysticism and the teachings of the soul. That the human spirit, or if you want to call it the human soul, whatever word you're comfortable with, is fundamentally a secure, confident, self-loving, and self-trusting entity. And there's no reason for it not to have all the confidence in itself and the respect for itself and the love for itself. And it's only the, the anomaly, we could say the aberration is, is the fact that we live in a world and people who have somewhat distorted our own awareness of our true selves. So it really comes down, who's the real you? If the real you is just what the product of circumstances, and those circumstances happen to be ones that, that undermined and eroded your self-esteem, then that's, that's your story. But if the real you is a fundamentally healthy entity that deserves and by its birthright has the power to be confident in itself because, to use the words of the mystics, you are divinely ordained. You are sent here on a purpose. You have a divine purpose, an indispensable mission to fulfill that you and only you can fulfill. Then it's a very different perspective on looking at yourself. Then the natural you is the confident you. And the rest is the aberration or the anomaly or the distortion. So the key thing is to then, in this sense, get, get to know yourself. Because you'll say, okay, fine, that sounds very good on paper, but how could I be sure? So my answer to that is, and that's really one of the biggest objectives of this class and all my classes, is get to know your real you. Not the you that projected you. Not the you that your parents may have taught you, who you th who, who, to think who you are. Not the, the you that society says you are. The real you. Can someone say that I really know who I am? So you say, where do we begin? You begin by studying and reading things that teach you what your soul looks like. And you know what will happen? It will resonate. That's the key. We're not talking about someone's ideas. Oh, great ideas. Resonance is the key. Everybody relates, for example, to these a few examples I'll give for this. You enjoy music. You enjoy a particular song. You unplug. You put on a headset. You surround yourself with the music. Nobody's around. What do you feel like when you're in the moment, in the zone, completely submerged, completely surrounded by beautiful harmonies, beautiful song? You feel like you belong. Something's resonating. You feel completely connected. You don't feel a dichotomy between who you are and what you do, between the subject and the object. And when you're truly absorbed, you almost become oblivious to your surroundings. So many people say, wow, that's true, it happens. But that's like a, uh, you know, that's a, a moment of grace. That's like a miracle. How would you like to know that that's your natural state and the rest is the aberration? When you spend nine months in your mother's womb, no matter how dysfunctional your mother may have been, and I'm saying she was or not, but even if she was, you were exactly nine months cons consistently, 24-7, submerged in the embryonic fluids which create a sense of belonging. And it's not an accident that when we're surrounded by music, people will sometimes describe it as like being underwater. Like go, to, go into water. We gravitate to water. What does it feel like when you go into a, a bath or an ocean, a pool, natural water, and you go underwater and you just feel a certain calm? What, why, why is it calming? So some biologists argue because since we were once amphibians, like frogs and uh, seals and uh, whatever we were. Um, you think you were a frog? Huh? Shark? What? Crocodile. Crocodile? Jellyfish? Whatever. You could decide. So therefore, we gravitate back to our roots, which is amphibious roots. I don't know. Maybe it's a nice theory. What I would submit, and this is based on the Kabbalistic and mystical teachings, we gravitate to water because we originate in water, the embryonic fluids. For nine months, we were 
basically submerged in, in water, and we were fed and drank and protected, and everything, our sustenance, even our breathing, everything came from there. On the macrocosmic level, the mystics say, the sages say, that the universe began mayim b'mayim, all submerged in water. If you think about it psychologically, it means that you began with a very big head start. You didn't, were not thrust into a hostile world and go figure it out. You were surrounded and protected. What does that do to the human psyche? That before we even emerge upon our births into this world, nine months we were completely protected. Now, if that continues after we emerge from the womb and after the umbilical cord is, cord is cut and our parents continue to maintain that type of nurturing, then that continues to cultivate that confidence. But you have it already inside of you because your soul, by, its vir by virtue of its being, is not an accident. No one gave it to you, so no one can take it from you. That's the ultimate definition of self-confidence. It's confidence being generated from within. You ask anyone that values themselves, people with high self-esteem, self and nothing to do with arrogance. As a matter of fact, the argument can make the most arrogant people are the people with the lowest self-esteem, and they compensate by their arrogance. Like, I remember meeting a guy who was just a very difficult person, and uh, so, I, so I wanted to know, like, what's, what, make, what makes this guy tick? So, so, so a friend, a mutual friend, tells me he hides his, his ignorance with his arrogance. I found that to be very insightful. It was exactly right. He hides his ignorance with his arrogance. Arrogance is usually a tool used by people to hide things that are um, missing. So they suddenly come, appear like supreme self-confident. Self-confident people, frankly, the real ones you'll meet are very humble. They don't make big stuff about them. Can they have a measure of arrogance? Oh, listen, arrogance is, comes sometimes with the turf, but it's not arrogance that defines them. Confident people have a sense from within their core that they are valuable, that they are valuable. Not valuable as opposed that someone else is not valuable, that they are important, and their opinion matters, and their position matters. Now, this doesn't mean they can't be wrong, and it doesn't mean that they, could, they can't stand corrected, but they have a sense of value, self-value. Where's that coming from? It does not just come from our parents. Our parents can confirm it and validate it. It comes from a sense of yourself, that yourself is important enough to have been put in this world. There's a line in my book, Toward a Meaningful Life, which has resonated with many people. And it obviously resonated with me. That's why I wrote it. And that is, birth is God saying, you matter. I'll share a story that I share from time to time. It's a very moving story. And one that, I could say, one of the most definitive moments in my life, this, this episode. When my book came out, which was initially, it came out in 1995. It's a long time ago. Before the war. I just I like to say that. I don't know what war. Before many wars. Uh, um, those of us from the 20th century before the war was the Vietnam War or the World War II that's before my time but anyway so when the book came out I was sent on a book tour by the publisher and uh, first it started out 20 cities major cities and then it was very successful because of the bookstore people would come you know it's usually a book, to, a book signing in those days I don't know how it is today yeah, 15, 20 people, it's considered successful. People were coming out more like 80, 90. So the publisher noticed, so they began to, they expanded my tour, ended up being 90 cities. I didn't mean in a day, obviously. It meant over a period of two years. <clears throat> so one of the cities I was at was St. Louis, St. Louis, Missouri, Midwest. And I'll, I remember the evening very well because, besides for the story, but... It was the night that they had all the JCCs in the United States. They had this uh, memorial service for Prime Minister Robin. That would have been 96, a problem, right? Who was assassinated. So, so a big turnout. So the evening in St. Louis, there were probably 2,000 people. And since I was a speaker, not because of the event, this event happened later, it was planned beforehand, so I had a lot of people there. Can't say they all remained, but I knew they didn't come to see me, so it was not necessarily fed my self-esteem just for the record. As an aside, I will just mention a few days earlier, I was in Chicago at the Barnes & Noble, 
and when I was entering, the, I, was, I, I was giving my talk that evening, as I was entering, literally maybe five, six hundred people were leaving. Now, first I thought they're leaving because I'm coming. Is that why they're leaving? No, then I find out. I said, what's going on? He said, Howard Stern was just here. His, he had a previous talk. And I said, yeah, interesting. So Howard Stern, this was the book he gave out. I forgot the name. But the cover of the book was him dressed in drag. So I remember the manager says to me, and that's, they just he finished hearing him, so they're leaving. So I said, why don't you tell them that I'm here next? He says, listen, if you dress like that, I'm sure they'll stay. So I wasn't ready to do that, okay? So just for the record, in case you're wondering um, how disruptive I can be, that's a line I won't cross, okay? Keith, does that uh, assuage your fears? Okay. Okay. Anyway, so, the, so I'm in the St. Louis, giving my talk. I get back to New York a little while later, and I receive this letter, email. <coughs> it was just the early days of email. Was it a letter? I don't remember, to be honest. But I remember almost word for word what the letter said. And you'll see why in a moment. It's a letter the woman, a woman, from a woman. She writes, I was in the audience hearing you, listening to you speak that other evening, St. Louis. Um, I was going to come over, but there was a long line, and then I didn't feel comfortable anyway, so I decided to put it in words. And she writes, embrace yourself. Listen to this. She writes, I'm a 47-year-old executive working at a prominent firm in St. Louis. I'm well-known and well-respected, and by any account, I'd be considered a success story. I have a high executive position, make good money, well-connected, growing, influential. But the fact is that beneath the veneer of success lies a woman, in, lays a woman in shreds. You see, my soul was murdered when I was a young child in the abusive home I grew up, where I endured ongoing violation emotionally, psychologically, sexually. And I am basically a wreck, a self-loathing wreck. And I've tried all types of therapy, nothing really works. The relationships are just a mess. I don't trust anyone, I constantly test people, test people, and therefore people don't trust me. And I've basically resigned myself to my lot, which is that I will never, I'm, I'm damaged goods. And what do people like me do when we, ha we don't have uh, inner control? We create outer control. I became super ambitious. I'm driven. I'm successful. You know? And it seems like I'm on top of everything. I'm in control of everything when I'm not in control of anything, actually. And I do. I have suicidal thoughts. I wake up every morning and I just take it day by day. I breathe in, go to work. I often just go to sleep crying, not sleeping. And I have given up hope. You come to town to St. Louis, and I was an audience, and someone had given me a copy of your book a few weeks earlier, Toward a Meaningful Life, someone at work. I'm Jewish, but not observant, not affiliated. I have no connection to anything. One of the reasons is because my family was not observant, but they were Jewish, and I just cut off from anything of that nature. It was all toxic to me. And I was reading your book, just leafing through it, not expecting I would read it, but the line jumped out at me. And the way this is she put, the way she put it, she said, like a silver bullet between the eyes, it resonated a deep chord inside of me. And the line was, birth is God saying you matter. And I read it again. This is all her letter. Birth is God saying you matter. And I read it a third time. Birth is God saying you matter. And I'll read it the rest of my life. I don't know why, but suddenly at age 47, I realized something I never knew. That despite what my parents did to me, despite what society does to you, undermines your, your self-value, despite what society, what business sees you as just a, a statistic on someone's balance sheet, and that you're measured by your looks, by your youth, by your performance, by your buying power, by your social status. Despite all that, I matter to the one that matters most, God. 
And the mere fact that I was born and that I exist on this earth, regardless of what anybody else says or thinks, means that God says, you're my child, I love you, you're indispensable. You have something to accomplish that you and only you can accomplish. As you write in that chapter of birth. And then she concludes the letter like this, which you can consider to be eloquent if it weren't under the circumstances. She says, so though I have many years to heal, but the first time in my life, I have hope. This is the way she put it. What I need to do is to create bypass surgery, to bypass the infected arteries that were violated and um, which, which used, was contaminated by my life experiences and reconnect to that pure moment at birth where God put me here and said, you're my child, I love you unconditionally. And then she finally concludes and writes, so thank you for giving me back my life. This is the letter. You understand? When I received this letter, I remember I was weeping. I could not stop crying. First of all, a woman sharing, a complete stranger sharing with me, she doesn't know me, uh, such a sacred confidence. I actually went back to read the chapter myself. Because, you know, when you write a book, when you write it, it's yours. Once it's out there, it's, it's the readers. People read what they read into it. And I wanted to see it in that way, and I actually appreciated it very differently, obviously. And I looked at that line, and I saw the different lines, and I saw how it affected her. So it really was very moving to me, firstly, that I could have such impact. It wasn't me, because obviously I was conveying teachings that come from my teacher, a mentor, and the teachers before us, thousands of years of resonating truths. And it resonated, and it affected her in this profound way, probably more than it affected me. I wrote her back, I remember, I wrote her back sharing uh, that I offer my friendship in any way I could help you. Thank you for writing. You know, just some kind words. And I asked her permission to tell the story. And she gave me permission. And I've told it probably, I would say over 100,000 people probably heard from me directly over the years. Maybe even more. I've written about it. And she, told, she asked me not to tell her name because she said, I'm sure people who have similar experiences will want to contact me or they want to show compassion to me. So just don't. And I still maintain con connection with her. It's a, it's a number of years. She's no longer now retired. And she still struggles, but she's an unbelievable person. And I've written to her more than once. We've written back and forth. I've written to her a few years later. I wrote, back, I wrote to her and I said, I want to thank you because you've given me a new appreciation of something I never really I took for granted. I said, I started asking audiences, you know, do you really matter? I would ask people, say, do you really matter? And of course, you get a giggle and a chuckle, and this people think is like a silly question. Of course I matter. What do you mean I matter? I have a bunch of plaques hanging on my wall. I have family that adore me. I have people who I pay to worship me, you know, whatever it is. I get honored. Of course I matter. We have healthy ego. So I rephrase the question. I say, let's put it this way. If you were never born, would it make a difference to anybody? If you were never born, would anybody, be, would anybody feel it's a tragedy? Remember, if you're not, no one knows you're here. So no one knows you're coming, so why would it be a disappointment if you don't show up? Once we're here, circumstantially, we feel that we matter and we're valuable because I'm, once I'm here, I'm going to justify my existence. But do you really have cosmic value? Do you really, are you really indispensable in a world of 7 billion people? And each one of those people has 75 trillion cells. And we're not going to get into all the species in the world and how many grains of sand exist. Do you really value, are you, or are you circumstantially, you're valuable to your family and to those that you love, and maybe you have made an impact and done good things. And I can tell you many people get a little queasy when I ask that question. If you were never born, would it make a difference? And I would go even a step further, and I wrote this to her. I said, you know, I even developed a theory that many people maybe, their drive for success, whether it's the ambition at work, whether it's making money, whether it's other conquests, maybe is masking an, sub, an unconscious fear that we really don't matter after all, so we have to find ways to make sure that we do and leave our mark. Like the pharaohs of old, they want to make sure that there's something eternal. And I continued and I said to her, you know, I have to thank you because sometimes it takes the eclipse of the sun to appreciate sunlight. I grew up, I'm the oldest of five children, 
talking about myself. You know, the oldest, a little spoiled probably, asked my siblings. The advantage of being oldest is that your siblings go to therapy for you and you don't have to go to therapy about them. That's the, but, you know, you become like a surrogate. Uh, and once your father passes away, they project it on you, whatever. I hope my brothers and sisters will forgive me. <laughs> they will. They have a good dose of self-confidence. So. <clears throat> so, but I took for granted. You know, my parents, were, I mean, no parents are perfect, but they treated me nicely and they nurtured me and they made me feel special. So is that the reason I matter? Because my parents told me they loved me and they validated me? And what happens if one day they wake up, God forbid, and they say, you know what? You're not that valuable as we thought you were. So then my stocks go down. Is it dependent on other people's validation? Even good people. So I say, you did not have that luxury. Because no one told that to you. They told you the exact opposite. And you came to the truth that only the eclipse of the sun can come to. And that is that you matter not because of what people tell you, even people who love you. You matter because you fundamentally matter because God, birth is God saying you matter. That's the real reason. That you have a fundamental value because you exist and you're here on this earth. It's all that matters. It makes no difference what you look like that day and how much you perform or not perform, as she put it so well. Now, if you have parents and friends and community that validate that, great, that, oh, come on, then it's tremendous because then you have not just your inherent value, but you also have others acknowledging it. But that is the real truth of where real confidence comes from. And it was from her that I learned that because without that, you know, you can convince yourself it's other factors. You know, you're successful at this, successful at that. But when you hear her story, it makes no difference. You can fail at everything and you still have absolute value. And that helped, un helped me understand something that I've seen in my life. I've seen people blessed with everything, with health, with wealth, with, with good looks, good education, and they could be miserable people. And then I see people who grew up in poverty and with no privileges and many challenges, and yet they have a certain profound refinement. I'm not saying it's mutually exclusive, but it tells you something that has nothing to do, circumstance don't, don't define your life. You can have the best and completely feel empty and have no confidence, and you can have an externals that are seemingly deprived of everything and be an extremely confident person. I've seen this. I've seen people who really struggle financially, struggle with other things, health-wise. I mean, I know a fellow, he's in California, he's suffering from uh, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. He has nothing left except his eyes, as far as movement goes. A loving wife and children. You have to see this man's spirit. It's almost, I went to visit him. I couldn't believe it. He's literally a vegetable, practically. He, ha he has the sparkle in the eye, and, he, and, he, and they figure there's a technology with his eyes he's able to type on screen. He has a sense of humor, and he's actually a musical guy, and I've watched videos of him. He was a dancer. I mean, he was like a really vibrant individual. And I say to myself, how can he? And he had challenges. I heard from friends that it wasn't easy. But he made a decision. He wants to dance at his, he wants to be at his children's weddings. Why would he deprive them of that? And I see because he's not focused on himself and his comforts. He's focused on the happiness of others and the love that he gives, not the love that he receives. You see these ingredients. Now, do we need to wait till something like that happens? God forbid. But it teaches you. Are we really appreciating what we really are? Or we appreciate the externals, the sizzle. You know? And God should bless us all. We should have everything. We should have the externals and the internal. But if someone had to say, where does it really originate from? Confidence and success. People say, give me enough money and I'll have all the self-confidence in the world. Does anyone really believe that? Actually, I think many people believe that. Because in our crazy minds, we think you can buy it. But it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. It's not what it works. There's actually nothing that someone can give you that will give you self-confidence, by the way. Not gifts, not money, not anything. Even health. These are all beautiful gifts, but they're not what's going to give you self-confidence is when you learn that you were put here and that you have value before you came to this world and you were sent on a mission and that, that godly mission gives you indispensability. Nobody can give that to you. No money in the world is indispensable. Everything dies. Everything physical is going to erode and wear, wear, wear down. Nothing, nobody has yet figured out how to take one penny with them to the next universe, the next world. 
So we value it. It's valuable here. It has a lot of power. No, no one denies that. But permanence? And who would have written a script that a people like the Jewish people, after they, what they suffered, would, would survive it all? Was it with money? With empires? And it wasn't just intelligence. It was because when you have the core spirit and you're in touch with it, you are indestructible. That's the word I want to use, indestructible. It's a fact. The odd thing is that challenges and difficulties bring out indestructibility in us more than comforts. When you're comfortable, you become apathetic, and you start valuing the things that really are not the forces, the, vo- the fuel that gives you confidence. You start valuing the external comforts. It's odd. You start saying to yourself, why should that be that way? Why can't I appreciate it? So this is another discussion that requires another class. But the point I want to make is that each one of us, and this really gets to the core of it. You know, I spoke earlier tools, how to compensate, how to build. But at the end of the day, it really comes down to believing in yourself. And that's part of also being around people that believe in you. You don't deserve people who don't believe in you in your life. What do you need people? And I'm not taking away from them. They may have a great value, but when you, every time you feel inspired, you make a phone call, and they have people telling you, don't get so excited, I was there already, and they throw cold water and make sure that you, they kill all your inspiration. What do you need that for? So I'm not suggesting throw out all these, these so-called friends of yours, but maybe add a few others so you have a little more time for people. When you call them, they say, oh, wow, that's a great idea. And they encourage you, and they say, go for it. I'm ready to help you. That's what we need around us. That's what we need. We live in a world where there's too much of the other voice that's what we need. And, 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 they're, and they're out there. And more importantly, not only do we need that, we need to be that way for people. Do you ever think to yourself, are you a person that people like to hang around? Are you give off positive energy? Like, you know, people, or people may want to avoid you. Do you give off negative energy? I know it's not a comfortable thing to ask yourself. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Am I like uh, toxic or what? You know? And most people are not going to tell you. You're going to go to your friend and say, call up and say, hey, tell me, do you like to be around me? Who's going to tell you? Actually, I hate being around you. I'm glad you're asking. You know? Um, not usually what you're going to hear. Um, so, you know, that's maybe a little more sensitive topic to be able to self-appraisal in that sense. But that's what we need. Energy, positive energy, brings up positive energy. You'll see. People that are successful people. People have a successful attitude, I should say. People have self-confidence. What do they do when you're around them? Unless you run away from them, you're afraid because of your own issues. They help you build confidence. That's how it is. You know, I was never in the military, but I hear people who are on teams like that. And it could be in, in sports or other things as well. There's something that you feel when you see a veteran. You see someone who's went through it, and they really are driven. You feel like you're in the hands of a master. And when you feel that, there's something that's very powerful. That's what really, as children, we should be feeling from our parents. But in case we didn't have that, or even if we had that, who since, since when do we not need the same dose when we're adults? That's what we need. And it's not common because we live in a business world. There are many people like this at home, they're that way. But when you get to the business world, you become a shark because everybody's a shark around you. Well, maybe it's time to begin to introduce a little heart and soul, even in the workplace, even in the raw capitalistic uh, money, um, business world. I'm not saying to be uh, become uh, become someone that people will abuse, but maybe it's time for confident people among us to give off that energy. I think I've mentioned this a few times. It was a, 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 also with my book when it came out. A top executive. I don't say his name because for confidential reasons, but he, I got to know him because there was a, CBS was doing a show on this class actually, and they. They, knew, they found out his name, and I met him as well. And he told me that since I re- got your book, and he was known as a real tough negotiator, a real SOB in business, and so on. Yeah? You know the term? Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't spell it out. Rabbi can say SOB, you know. Huh? There you go. Brazil keeps coming up. <laughs> um, so, so he tells me, I met him. He tells me that, that since he read the book, he decided, because in the book there's a chapter on business, how do you so-called spiritualize your business? 
Like how do you spiritualize any part of your life? One of the suggestions was to have a charity box in your office. And from time to time, to throw in a few pennies. So he decided to do that. Why not? He had a charity box. And he had some top, you know, high-powered meetings. And he made it a custom that at the end of the meeting, he gave everybody a few coins and everybody put in some charity. It wasn't the amount, it was the gesture. And he said meetings started to change because people started saying, one second, why are we doing that? You know, is this a business deal? No, even an ethical business deal. Business is business. Why do we suddenly... And he said, because we're introducing something, a shift. It's a little heart and soul about that we are here to give, not just to take. And then he decided to start giving out the books. He had a few cases in his office, and he started giving out. He says, it changed my life. The values I always had, but it was not per, uh, permeating my business world. You know, when I came home, I was a nice guy. Maybe not so nice. But at work, I was the tough guy doing what I have to do. I, I, I trust I was ethical, but still, I was, you know, this is business is business. Pleasure is pleasure. And he says, I brought soul, and it really changed my life. And I thought about it. It was a very, you know, to me, that's like a tremendous thing. Even though you could say what dramatically really changed. No, but these are qualitative shifts that change the world. Because capitalism and money are not meant to be soulful. That's why I find it always so interesting, even ironic. Of all the countries in the world, the only one that has on their currency, the epitome of materialism, in God we trust. It's amazing. This is not a prayer book. It's not a Bible. It's not a, 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 a religious service. Money. Open it up. Every coin, every dollar bill, every hundred, whatever currency it is and God we trust nowhere in the world in Europe forget about it separation of church and state I don't know to me it's some type of divine providence that demonstrates that someone seems to sense that's what we really need we need a little and I'm not talking about the God of other people that is a God of uh, destruction or violence I'm talking about obviously the love trust and God we trust if you can trust in God then you can trust in the soul the divine soul that's inside of you and of all places, it reminds us of all places, like I said, in our, on our currency. So you may not have God on your wall in your house, but if you have it in your money, and you like money, you're going to have more God. <laughs> and maybe we should learn the message, the lesson. So my friends, there's much to say on this topic. And I, I always feel in these type of topics, you always want to say more because it's such an f- important key topic. But the main thing to say is that you have what you need inside of you. There's no book. There's no... Uh, commodity, there's no product that's going to give it to you. There may be books that inspire, that help you cultivate that. But you have it in you. You have that right. And interesting, the founding fathers in the Declaration of Independence, they said it. They said, all men, I would say, all people are created equal and have inalienable divine rights endowed to them by the divine. The pursuit of happiness, the pursuit of whatever the lines are there. The point is that they understood that it comes from a greater place. So nobody could take it away from you because no one gave it to you. Because you could argue, they could have said, all people are born equal. All people are equal. Why do they have to use the word created? Created is a creator. And today that would be, forget about it. The debates would be raging. And the word divine. So I never saw this anywhere, but I assume, because they were wise enough to understand, because if it's not going to be clearly spelled out that it's an act of God, then people could say, hey, I gave you these rights and I could take them away from you. Once you attribute it to the divine, that's it. It's, it's absolute. And there's nobody in the world can say, to the point that it was built in the Declaration of Independence, even though the, the founding father had slaves, and even though other type of so-called human abuses, but they built in a statement that would ultimately undermine their own uh, business interests. Because they put in that all people are equal, all people created by God. I'll just conclude on a, since it comes to mind, on a humorous, a humorous note, but the same idea. I once asked a, uh, was it an insurance attorney? I said, it's an interesting thing. With this whole um, agnostic and atheist different court cases going on in the country about prayer in the schools or, you know, all these different stories about displays of any type of religious displays in public areas. How come nobody uh, like, is challenging the statement that you find in every contract, in every insurance policy, rather, that this policy covers uh, this damage, that damage, but not, let's say, winds or earthquakes and other acts of God? They always write acts of God. 
Why don't they write natural disasters or natural acts? So ask an attorney, what is this suddenly God? It's suddenly in the picture. So he said smilingly, which is exactly what I was leading up to, he said to me, because if we say nature, then there can be an argument who's supposed to, who's responsible for nature. But if you blame it on God, I don't, I'm, I'm not God, you're not God, so that's not my problem, the insurer will say. You say nature, you could say one second. You as the insurer should have taken account that na- there could be natural things. So suddenly when we need a scapegoat, especially a financial out, God is a very convenient uh, one to blame. Or as the angel of death, when, when, the, when the world was created, the angel of death came to God and said, why are you giving me this job? People will hate me for bringing death to this world. So God said, don't worry about it. They'll blame heart attacks, cancer, diabetes, other things. They'll never blame you or me. <laughs> they'll, they'll find some... Uh, anyway, just a little, um, a little uh, humorous. My friends, I, for one, was educated and taught... And I believe it about myself and I believe it equally about you that we do not know who has the greatest soul sitting in this room right now or anyone on this planet. These are divine mysteries. But I do know, without question, that life is not worth it unless we respect and recognize that each of us has absolute dignity and majesty in our being and in our life journey. And that everything that happens during your life is part of that dignity. Yes, we can make mistakes. Can correct our mistakes, but never ever give up on yourself and give up on the fundamental indispensability of your life. Because the fact is that you matter now and forever. Every one of your actions matters now and forever. And you are indispensable because what you can accomplish, no one that ever lived and no one that ever will live can do what you have to do. If you can tell that to yourself every morning and every evening and as many times that you need to remind yourself, it is the key. And just like exercise, you can't say I exercised a month ago and it's going to work for today. Every day, just like you need to breathe every, min- every minute, every moment, and you need to eat and drink, you need to, re- you need to um, reinforce and reinval- uh, what's the word I want to say? Val- re- revalidate this statement again and again because we're not living in a neutral world. There are forces all around us that attack the statement that I just said. Nobody's going to put up a billboard in, in Times Square or anywhere Birth is God saying you matter. Because why would they spend money? What product do you have to buy for that purpose? There's nothing to buy. You already have it. You matter because God put you here. So why would anyone... So no one's going to make that announcement. You have to announce it to yourself. Everybody else is going to try to get a piece of you and try to convince you that you're valuable if you do this, you eat that, you drink that, you smoke this, you don't smoke, you look like that, you look like that. But the answer is it's in you. So that's very fitting to our organization that I have the honor to lead, which is Meaningful Life Center, Meaningful Life, that you have a meaningful life, an absolutely meaningful life. God should bless you all, and should you find your navigational tools to, to navigate the vicissitudes, the twists and turns, but know with full confidence that you can make it, and know that you have my voter confidence as well, and I hope you have, I have yours. So until next Wednesday, everybody have a very confident self-esteem saturated week and if you want any way to be in touch if you want to as i said run by any ideas just feel free to contact us meaningfullife.com is very easy to reach us or send us your email address now you know we're on all the channels facebook youtube i don't even want to start listing them all because i don't even know all of myself i just know that today you have to use all the channels because you never know how do you reach people everyone have a very very uh, blessed week thank you Does everybody feel a little more self-confident now than when you came in? That's the key. I have a special help. My name is Seagal from Chile. You are? From Chile. Chile? Ah, very nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, you have been there from once. uh, I was there in Chile? I was in Peru. Me or my brother? Uh Uh-uh. My brother? I'm not sure. That's what I'm saying. Who is your brother? Joseph Fitzgerald.